this morning. I want to say this before I start. And uh, the Lord uh, really gave me a download yesterday. And these were the words that I wrote down, and I think this is so important. Now, of course, tonight is when I will share my uh, prophecies for 2024 and beyond, but this is just um, as much of a relevant now word than any of the things that I'll share tonight, and that is this. We must, in this hour, learn how to extract the precious from the vile now more than ever. If not, if we don't, we are in danger of discounting many movements and leaders who have fallen but who had real precious truths and experiences that were real. And we'll be in danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. No, I don't know why uh, that adage or that saying it's kind of a morbid thought really but uh, the baby out with the bathwater. but it really does drive that point home there's something important about being able to extract the precious from amidst the worthless and the vile and that's scriptural but today i'm with the help of the holy spirit i'm going to minister on this subject the restoration of the apostolic and prophetic ministry the restoration of the apostolic and prophetic ministry. This is really important uh, for 2024 and beyond. Now, I'm going to preach on this theme today, but if you want to dig more down into this theme, into both of these themes, the prophetic and the apostolic, um, in our bookstore, Rick Joyner has written two books, um, you see them both there, the apostolic ministry and the prophetic ministry. And both of those will even break down even more uh, things than I'm going to be able to fit into this message this morning. But let me just read from Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Remember, that's the purpose. After the ascension or because of the ascension, the ultimate goal is for him to fill all things with himself. Verse 11, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till, somebody say till. That's how you know Paul was a southerner. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's growing up in him to match his height, his stature. Okay, verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, which is Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. You're a joint. You're a joint that's not just supposed to come and withdrawal from transactional Christianity. We, we, we suffer from consumer Christianity, which I go to church, I go to conferences to get something. But every joint supplies. 
they contribute, they put something into it according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now there is a debate in the church, I don't mean necessarily the charismatic church, but in the body of Christ at large, whether the concept of apostles and prophets are still functioning in the church today. You've probably heard those debates, many uh, conservative evangelicals, and not all, but many, believe and claim that uh, the idea that there could be modern day apostles and prophets, they would say is total heresy. And obviously there have been times throughout church history where, you know, you could throw a, a, a bowling ball out in the crowd at some conference and you're bound to hit an apostle or prophet. Uh, because I think what's more important than the title is the function. And uh, so there may have been times in church history that were, where there were false starts, but I want to tell you something. I believe we're coming into a time where the Lord wants to complete and perfect his church. And it's going to require more than just three out of the five of five-fold ministry. So this is more than just an issue of accusing those who claim the opposite or claim the belief that there are the poss there is the possibility of modern day uh, prophets and apostles they would say that's pride and assumption but he would they would even go further many evangelicals would say the idea that there could be modern day uh, apostles and prophets is not just pride and presumption but in fact we need to protect the flock from imposters and those who would claim extra biblical revelation and lead the naive astray and then of course there are those who believe that there are modern apostles and prophets and they believe that it is vital for edification and the building up and the completing of the building of the temple of the living God. He does not dwell in temples made with hands, but now he dwells individually in us. Our body is the temple, but there's also the corporate body of Christ, the temple which is his body. Now, this division of those who believe that uh, apostles and prophets are a modern ministry versus those who believe that it is not something for today, that division is more than just a theological or academic difference. It's significant, so important to the purpose and actually the destiny of the body of Christ itself. Because the root of the issue is, and here's the question, how is the risen and glorified and ascended Savior building his church? How is he doing it? How is he going to complete it? How is he going to finish this? If apostles and prophets are for today, then we should receive them with all humility so that Christ's ultimate plan can be and is accomplished in the body of Christ. To see the Lord's house built on the earth unto completion unto the full measure of the stature of Christ, unto the measure of a perfect man, till we all come into the unity of the faith and the perfect knowledge of the Son of God. How many figured out that in over 2,000 plus denominations in Christianity, that hasn't been accomplished yet? Now we're to preserve the unity of the Spirit until we are brought into the unity of the faith, and I believe it will be a last day's grace that, that will be released to help bring the church or the remnant together into the unity of the faith. It's going to be accomplished by more than just us 
winning a theological or academic debate proving that apostles and prophets are for today. It's going to take much more than that, but it's going to be a grace of God that's reserved for this last day, a grace that will help bring about the completion, the unification, and the edification of the body of Christ so that the corporate body of Christ looks, acts, talks, and thinks just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Until the body of Christ attaches to the head. And the head, of course, is, is Christ. Now, Paul says the first thing that Jesus did after his death, burial, and resurrection, of course, we know he went and took the keys from the devil down below uh, of death, hell, and the grave. But then it said, the, f the next thing he did was he ascended. Somebody say ascended. Back to heaven. And the first thing he did after the ascension is that he gave the church certain gifts. He gave himself. I like that wording, by the way. He said, I, I didn't delegate the angels or anybody else. No, I'm going to do this myself, the Lord says. Myself, I'm going to give some apostles. It's the fivefold ministry, some prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The apostle is like the thumb. He can give grip to hold the sword of the Spirit. The prophet is like the index finger. He can help point the way. The evangelist is like the middle finger because he has the longest outreach. The pastor is the ring finger because that is the individual that you have a covenant with. And then the teacher is like the pinky because the pinky is the only finger that can scratch that itching ear on the inside. <laughs> Heaping unto themselves teachers having itching ears. But notice now the emphasis here is he himself, meaning Jesus Christ in his risen glorified position as the head of the body, as the head of the church, will give these gifts for the church to grow and increase and mature and come unto full maturity and completion and be perfected. So that when Jesus comes, he will have a church or a bride without spot or wrinkle. And the ministry of the fivefold ministry is that ministry of the friend of the bridegroom who stands with the bridegroom and rejoices at the thought of being able to hear his voice. That's what being prophetic is all about, is being able to hear the voice of the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom stands and listens, and he, he gets his joy solely from standing with the bridegroom and helping secure and protect a bride to stay pure until the marriage. You know, John the Baptist fulfilled the role of the friend of the bridegroom, and then Paul in 2 Corinthians also fulfilled that role. He said, I, I, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy that I would be able to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And the friend of the bridegroom was just that, while the bridegroom would go away to build the house or the dwelling place where the married couple would live after marriage. The friend of the bridegroom, he wasn't looking out for his self-interest. No, he was there to protect, preserve, defend, and guard to make sure that the bride stayed pure and chaste until the wedding. The best modern equivalent that I could compare the friend of the bridegroom to in our modern culture and Western culture is, uh, and it falls very short of the actual full meaning, but the best man in the wedding he stands for the purpose with the groom. Now, when the bride comes walking down the aisle, the best man, the friend of the bridegroom, he's not saying, I hope she notices me. <clears throat> I'm just going to make sure I look all prim and proper because I know she's married him, but I hope that she'll notice me because I kind of look good today too. And, and maybe her attention will be diverted and she'll get distracted and she'll look at me while she's walking down the aisle. Can you imagine how crazy that would be? 
Well, this is the reason why the friend of the bridegroom ministry that Paul assumed in 2 Corinthians, John the Baptist assumed, and that Jesus himself gave that uh, friend of the bridegroom uh, ministry to all of his disciples. He entrusted that they were not concerned about drawing attention to themselves to capture the bride's attention. No. The friend of the bridegroom's purpose is to make sure that the bride stays pure and holy and undefiled. He's not looking to catch the bride's attention. No, he's standing with the bridegroom to ensure the wedding happens. And the purpose of the fivefold ministry is the ministry to the saints to produce the ministry of the saints. See, this whole idea of, you know, the pastor, he does everything. He, he does all the weddings. He's, he shows up and prays for every sick person in the hospital. and He cleans the toilets and sweeps the floors and all that. I don't know. We've got, and of course, I know many of you are way past that. But that old kind of thinking hasn't completely been eradicated from the church because the truth is, it's not a one or two man show. Church services are much more than just a weekly evangelistic crusade every Sunday morning. Yes, I'm all for souls being saved. I'm all for our church services leading people to the Lord. But our church services should be aimed in focus to equip and to train the saints of God for their ministry the other six days of the week. All the duties and responsibilities that we used to think back in our old mindset that just fell on the pastor is actually the ministry he's called us unto. And God's going to help some of you identify your ministry so that you can walk in purpose. Yeah, go to church. Go to church on Sunday, but be, be, be even more careful to be the church the other six days of the week. Find your purpose, find your anointing, find your calling, get trained and equipped so that you can fulfill it, but stay connected to the body. This is why here at Morningstar we have, you know, eight or nine conferences all year long that speak to the different facets of our culture, the seven mountains, you know, to education, the New Era Conference, to worship, to various different things, the prophetic. We also speak into the political realm. And uh, we have a School of the Prophets, which is one weekend a month that goes from September till May. This year we have 425 students, the largest year yet. This is our third year doing it since, you know, I've came here. And it's our largest year yet. Why? Because it's not just about one or two or three big name prophets every generation that seem to have the unique gifts. God wants to raise up a company of people. So he gave... Now, 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 this is important that you hear this part. The fivefold ministry is the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's distinguished from the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. The fivefold ministry gifts are from Jesus, the nine gifts of the Spirit are from the Holy Spirit. And that's the reason why you can have the gift of prophecy, but not be a fivefold prophet. Now, no one questions the validity of the last three of the five. Every denomination, for the most part, you know, accepts church has teachers. We have evangelists. We have pastors. In fact, we actually did a great disservice, the denominational world, over the years. And I contributed to this problem at one time. I was a part of it that we used to think that the set man or woman over any house of worship had to be the pastor. When in reality, the set man or woman, their primary or doma gifting may not be pastoral. They may be apostolic or prophetic, or they may be evangelistic. They are called to be the set man or set woman over that house, but they must gather around them and the Lord will send the people who have that pastoral and prophetic gifting so that whoever the set man is can make sure that the fivefold gifts is developing and maturing and edifying and building up the church unto fullness unto readiness
Now, the debate isn't over the pastor, the teacher, and the evangelist. The debate's over the first two, apostles and prophets. Now, I want to make this point. There is no break in the continuity of the gifts. The fivefold gifts or the nine gifts of the Spirit. Notice what it says when it lists apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher are given to the church till. Didn't say three out of five till. All five till. Have we all come to the unity of the faith yet? Under the perfect knowledge of the Son of God or knowing intimately the Son of God? Have we come under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ growing up into Him in all things? No. Then it would be inconsistent interpretation and lack of understanding to just take it upon yourself to delete two out of the five just because you don't understand the purpose of them. There's no scripture that says that they stopped or ceased or no longer exist. It's nothing more than cessationism assumption. Plain as day. It's assumption of cessationists. Because the fivefold is for until we da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Now, I think it's important to paraphrase Ephesians 4, verses 13 and 14. These gifts are given until we all come to a mature man. Speaking of the spiritual corporate maturity of the whole body. Not just individual members within the body, but until we're no longer tossed as children to and fro by every wind of doctrine, or every cunning scheme of deceitful, unproven men and women. Listen, some of us, we, we, our, our faith and our confidence in God and what we believe gets shaken too easily. God's wanting to build us upon the rock. Come on, you, you ought not let a Facebook post or a YouTube video shake your faith in what you believe to know to be true. We cannot be that shakable. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken and everything's going to be tested by fire. But the church moving away from spiritual immaturity has kept her impressionable and unstable. Because the church has not moved away yet from, from spiritual immaturity because of the purpose of the fivefold, which is to bring the church to full spiritual maturity and to uh, where she'll be the full measure of the stature of Christ, where the body will connect with the head. And, and until that happens, many will be impressionable and unstable. So in order to grow up in every way and in all things unto him, which is our head Christ, we need the fivefold ministry. In the next chapter, Paul states that, that Christ in his death gave himself out of deep love for her. Ephesians 5, 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, he should, that she should be holy and without blemish. Also in Revelation 19, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Right now, God is trying to reestablish the fivefold ministry to help bring the bride unto readiness. So when we put these verses together, Ephesians 4 and Ephesians 5, we see a cleansed, spotless, radiant church or bride ready to meet the bridegroom. Which means, number one, the call to readiness is dependent upon the ministry gifts, not just spiritual gifts, as listed in Ephesians 4. Ministering to the church to help bring her to that spotless, radiant condition. Notice the difference between ministry gifts and spiritual gifts. Now, the combination of both the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and coming to a mature man corporately to grow up in all things into Christ who is our head, 
are all a part of this divine process. The capacity of the body to be joined and knit together by Christ and every single member of the body, and that includes you, to bring his or her part of God's supply that God graced them with. Whatever your supply is, don't take your ball and go home, right? No, bring your supply. You're a joint of supply to the body to help accomplish this holy bonding, this holy growing and maturing. This maturing process is dependent upon fivefold ministry till. Now they are servants who equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Notice who equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Equipping the saints to do the work of ministry. I hope you catch that part. Equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. You mean the pastor's not solely responsible for doing all the Bible studies and visiting and praying for all the sick and, and speaking at every funeral? And No. The, the, the church, the body has got to come unto the ministry of the saints. Say that with me. The ministry of the saints. But the fivefold have to have a servant's heart and be willing to equip the saints so that they come under the full measure of the stature. They keep growing up into him in Christ's likeness until ultimately the Christ life inside of them, which is currently in seed form, swallows up the, corrupt, the corruption part of them. And his life is not just an addition to our life. His life becomes our life. Christ is our life. There's no scripture, I want to say it again, there's no scripture that says Christ canceled two out of the five ministry gifts. It's never mentioned once in the whole canon of scripture. And this idea that, well, once the canon of scripture was finished, then the need for apostle and prophet was done away with because we had a full canon of scripture. That's also a huge assumption because the Bible never says that. You understand that, right? It, don't you think something this important, Paul or Peter or John or one of them would have said, now once we finish writing the New Testament, you're going to be able to cut out two out of five that's required to perfect, mature the saints into the full measure of the stature of Christ. Don't you think they would at least told us, be prepared for this when this happens. When the Bible's complete, you're no longer going to need the apostle and prophet. It's total assumption. There's no verse that supports that at all. Zero. If the presence of these gifts is necessary till, till the end, if the presence of these gifts is necessary, then the absence of these gifts are costly. Make no mistake. The absence of these five ministry gifts have stopped the church from fruitfulness and function. I mean, think about it. Just the corporate body of Christ. Think about how fragmented and immature the church is in so many expressions throughout Christianity. So many filled with selfish ambition, ego on full display, with professionalism replacing power, with insecure leaders and saints fighting for position and to be seen and heard or for this constant need for affirmation or personal attention, or you're going to take your ball and go home. Consider how many Christians think about this, wander from church to church, leaving a mess everywhere they leave. Living without the true fruit of the, of the Spirit, the true fruit or purpose, maybe caught up in being divisive over some pet doctrine some agenda, some personal agenda, some personal selfish ambition, living frustrated lives, lacking vision while missing the main thing. But a church coming into perfection or completion, living fruitful lives of service to God and to his people in unity, that's when you'll feel like your life has true purpose. If not, until then, you'll try to find purpose in a lot of other stuff. 
Could, could the present state of the church in the West be a result of the lacking of the washer, washing of the water by the word through the fivefold, not the threefold, fivefold ministry gifts all flowing together into a place of fruitful service? Could it be that the voice of many waters, the voice of five voices of the water that flow, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, could it be that the lack of the washing of the water of the word is, is not fully bringing the church into readiness and radiance because much of Christianity has canceled out two out of the five. And their voice has no room. Therefore, the voice cannot bring the washing to the bride to make her without spot or wrinkle because it's washed by the water of the word. Ephesians 2.19, Now therefore you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you're also being built together. We're being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. God wants to do more than just visit you. He wants to do more than just quicken you or rest on you. He wants to live in you. He wants you to become a habitation of God through the Spirit. Man will never be at home. I believe it was St. Augustine who said until he finds his home in God. So many people use Ephesians 2, 19 through 23, or 22 rather, as the verse to do away with the apostolic and prophetic ministry because they say, we don't need the apostle and prophet because, it's, remember it said, we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Well, do we still need the cornerstone? Has he stopped fulfilling his priestly role in ministry? then why would you say that you don't need a continuation of the foundation? Which is apostles and prophets were built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets. Yeah, but Jesus fulfilled his work. Yes, but he ever lives to make intercession. He is our great high priest and he is returning again. We don't say we're going to do away with the cornerstone or that the cornerstone is no longer presently active, but... Much of Christianity says, oh yeah, the cornerstone, he's presently active, but we had to tear the whole flooring and foundation out. And, and they, they say, well, the foundation for doctrine has been laid in the New Testament. Therefore, there's no need for apostles and prophets. Now, let, I want you to hear this next part. It's really important. Making this argument of, well, because the doctrine and the beliefs were established in the first century by the, by the apostles in the New Testament teaching and doctrine, we would not use this same reasoning to dispel or expel the need for teachers or pastors or evangelists. Well, but the, the scriptures, the foundation's already been laid, therefore we don't need the, the apostles and prophets anymore. The problem with that is, if you accept that, then you also have to say, that you no longer need pastors and evangelists and teachers. You say, no, we still believe you can have that. The scripture gives us no liberty to cut out any of the ascension gifts. Because there's a perfect symmetry between the first century apostles and prophets and those who will be used to see this thing finished and completed at the end. Now we can believe this while recognizing and acknowledging that the first century apostles certainly are bestowed with a special and unique honor, the original 12. Absolutely. We must still recognize, though, that Christ bestows all ascension gifts today, five out of five, he always has, and he always will, till. Till. And we should receive the grace given to them as vessels of the Holy Spirit. Now, it just blows me away how that some people say, yeah, but, but this is a foundation 
is laid by the apostles and prophets. So that because the apostles and prophets laid the foundation, we don't need them. But I would just simply say, if you're saying that, that the modern day apostles and prophets um, are adding extra biblical revelation that contradicts the Bible, then yes, I totally agree with you, that's a serious problem. But just like pastors and evangelists and teachers teach the scripture, so do modern day apostles and prophets fulfill the same function of the uh, of just like the pastor and teacher and evangelist only preaches the scripture that's well why we, why do we think that the apostles and prophets aren't doing the same thing the one who is sent and the one who hears the voice of the lord for current situations and scenarios and shows you how the written word can become a rhema word in your personal life at any given moment and what's god you say yeah but we don't need any extra biblical revelation we don't need the prophetic listen you are going to have some days where you're going to have to make life or death decisions. And if you solely rely upon your intellect or your human will, you may end up making the wrong one. But when you get a clear prophetic word, the Bible can't tell you whether you should live here or, or, or start a church over there. Or, and, and, and it's funny because many of the same people that deny the existence of the apostle and prophet will still tell you, I'm just trying to do what God's telling me to do. That's called the prophetic. <laughs> yeah, but the pastor and the teacher and the evangelist, they just preach what's already been given. So do the apostle and prophet. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse one. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I'm not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Paul was not ashamed of his apostleship as it was manifested in the fruit of the lives of those who received him. Hear this now. Their ability to receive the ministry of Christ through him was tied to their acceptance of the grace of God in him for apostleship. And he recognized he wasn't an apostle to everybody. He, he said it. He said, if I'm not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you. He recognized he didn't have spiritual authority over the entire body of Christ. And this is one of the most dangerous things when spiritual leaders want to usurp their spiritual authority over areas or domain in the body of Christ that they haven't been given grace to bring oversight to. I am not a grace to the whole body of Christ. You understand that there are some parts of the body of Christ who don't understand the prophetic, they don't understand. They, they despise people like me. You know what I'm saying? They really do. They, they despise anybody that, and so they have to try to prove it's either not real or it's of the devil. And that one gets me, because once they get past the place of being able, after an honest evaluation, to say, yeah, there's no way you could know that stuff. That has to be prophetic. Then it kicks into, it's of the devil. Isn't it crazy how so many Christians believe the devil can do more supernatural stuff today than God does? They limit God's supernatural ability to the past. If there's any supernatural in the present, it's the devil. I appreciate great gifts in the body of Christ. People like, for instance, John MacArthur. He's an excellent Bible teacher. I'm not going to sit up here and condemn him. But I certainly disagree with him on many things. But I'm not going to diminish his entire gift. I just pray that he'll come into more revelation of the fullness of the reality of the word, and I will too. 
But you know what's interesting? Is many of those same individuals would not say something like that about somebody like me or Cindy or Rick or somebody like that. We're imposters and we are totally of the devil. Seriously. I recognize I don't have authority in every area of the body of Christ. That's why our ministry, as every ministry does, has a board, right? You, you're accountable uh, to those who are put around you. And it's interesting, there are some people that want to be the police in the whole body of Christ. And he recognized, Paul did, he didn't have spiritual authority with all. But Jesus said, Matthew 10, 41, he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet receives their reward. And my jacket literally changed the, the slides here. There we go. There it is. I wish I could have said that was God doing that, but you know, no. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. You say, well, I, I receive what they have given me, but I, they're not a prophet. They're not an apostle. They're not a pastor. But they, they, they can still give something decent. No, you got to receive in the name of that gift to get that reward. The purpose of the fivefold is to build God's temple made of lively stones perfectly knit together, forming a habitation for God. Remember what Jesus said? In my Father's house are many rooms. And Jesus prepared a place for you in that house. There's a brick, a lively stone with your name on it. Now, eldership and deaconhood and bishop, these can be desired, Paul said. He wrote to Timothy, if any man desires the office of an elder or deacon or such. But fivefold ministry is God called. It's not based on personal desire. These positions can't be aspired to like career opportunities. They're a call. And the fear of the Lord must return to the body of Christ in all matters. But especially in regards to divine appointment and divine calling. In the Old Testament, it was a serious thing to transgress the boundaries of God's calling. Ask Hezekiah and ask King Saul. Insecure leaders usurping a role or title out of a need for affirmation or to meet an unmet need of acceptance with men will not produce fruit or true spiritual authority. True spiritual authority is to build the house or the temple of God as the wise master builder. Let me tell you, a divine call will be evident to all, or I'll say most. <laughs> There also must be a recognition among the people of God to distinguish the difference from being called and being commissioned. Many were sent. Many weren't sent. They just went. Just because you're called doesn't mean it's time for your commissioning yet. You need that training and equipping and somebody to be able to disciple you. Paul met the Lord on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. Remember? even though he never met Jesus in the flesh. And that's one of the reasons to say, well, one of the qualifications, you've got to be able to see the Lord Jesus to be an apostle. Well, as far as we know, Paul never met Jesus during the time of his earthly existence on earth and in in when he was a human on earth. But he saw the Lord in a vision. And many years later, in Antioch, the leaders gathered together to pray, and the Holy Spirit said, separate unto me, Paul and Silas, for the work I've called them to do. Many years later, there's a difference between the call and the commission. And when the church blessed them, and the Holy Spirit said, separate to me, Paul and Silas, for the work I've called them to do, they were adding the blessing to that which the Lord had preordained. Do not ever mistake the call for a commissioning. Be trained and equipped and ordained. Today the church is awash with self-help messages, psychology, personal enhancement, how to live your best, most productive life. Personal enhancement instead of being built on Christ in you and revealing and manifesting through you. I'm crucified with Christ, yet I live. Yet not I, but Christ who lives within me. 
Others preach the gospel of salvation every week to the same converted souls. Never unveiling the gospel of the kingdom, which includes the mysteries of Christ, the revelation of the beauty of the Lord and gazing on his beauty, the internal kingdom, Jesus is bridegroom, king, and judge. In other words, converts aren't becoming disciples when the goal of growing in all things into him who is the head, which is Christ. If they do never primarily focus on growing up and maturing in him, then they only stayed a convert and didn't become a disciple. There's got to be a greater revelation. If you don't hear anything else I say in 2024, there's got to be a greater revelation of Christ in and through you. The hope of glory. The true goal is not bigger buildings made with hands, but building a living temple. Not made with hands, framed and fitly fitted together to strengthen the believer's union with Christ and an upward growth and an upward increase in the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ collectively in his people. The goal is for full manifestation of our sonship. More of the fullness and the glory of the resurrected, risen Christ through his body on the earth. How much of Christ is filling his people? Is it even a priority anymore to attain the fullness of Christ? I call the church back to that priority to attain the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 3, 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints, not just a few. What is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God? That's got to be the goal. 1 Peter 2, 4, coming to him as to a living stone. Rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God, precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it's also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him by no means will be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, they stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were also, to also they were appointed. 1 Corinthians 3. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal. What, isn't that a tragedy? As to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk, not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able, for you're still carnal. For where there are envy, envy, strife, divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Oh, I wish the church would hear this. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another says, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed. As the Lord gave to each one, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace which is given to me as a wise master builder apostles build something prophets get the insight and the blueprints for what the apostles build I've laid the foundation and another builds on it but let each one of you take heed to how it builds on it for no other foundation can any man lay that which is laid which is Jesus Christ how many of you know that when you go into a city where the gospel's never been preached somebody's got to lay that foundation 
You say, well, it's already been laid. That's true. Not there, though. Not there, not in those people's hearts and minds and lives and beliefs. So that requires the ministry of the apostle. And if it lacks that, it's going to lack in its spiritual growth and capability. Here's the apostles mentioned in the New Testament. You ready for this? Look at this. The people say there's only the original 12. Jesus Christ, Simon Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James, Thaddeus, Simon, Judas Iscariot, Matthias, Paul. Now, starting now at, at, at Matthias and Paul, these are ascension apostles, meaning they saw the Lord post-ascension in a spiritual encounter. Paul, Barnabas, this is after Jesus' earthly life. Andronicus, Junia, by the way, that was a female apostle. It's in the Bible, and these are people who are called apostles. Oh, there's only the original 12. Really? Look it up for yourself. There are the verses. Junia, James, Silas is called an apostle. Timothy, Epaphroditus. Good luck with that one. Apollos. And then there were two unnamed apostles. Nine of these are ascension apostles. Say ascension apostles. I mean, they weren't a part of the original 12 that walked with Jesus on the earth. They were ascension apostles. There are two things holding back the coming of the Lord. I'm almost done. Two things holding back the coming of the Lord. Are you all doing okay? Yeah. Number one, the restoration of the apostolic and prophetic ministry to bring the church unto fullness of Christ and perfection. Number two, the accuser of the brethren has to be cast down. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Oh, look at this. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now, somebody say now. now. Salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. How many of you are ready for that? How many of you want the kingdom of God to come? How many of you want the power of his Christ to come in the last days? That tells you why. For the accuser of the brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. The kingdom of God and the power of his Christ doesn't come until the accuser is put down finally once and for all. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and did not love their lives even to the death. One of Satan's last titles in scripture is the accuser. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind, troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as it is from us as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. Listen carefully. For that day will not come. What's delaying the coming of the Lord? That day will not come until the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Notice verse 6. And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. So when he, the restrainer, is taken out of the way, then the lawless one comes who's ultimately destroyed at the brightness of the second coming, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Go back to Revelation 12, 9 again. Look at this. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. 
Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and did not love their lives to the death. Wherefore, therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. Oh, what am I saying? I believe Satan is the one who's doing the restraining. Now, you don't have to agree with me on this. This is my opinion, but it's a strong opinion. And let me explain it to you. Satan is the one restraining. Once he is cast down in Revelation 12 and 10, he then enters into the Antichrist and the man of sin is revealed. But remember, he doesn't want this to happen. Everybody says, oh, the devil would love to get us accelerated and get us to Armageddon. I don't believe so. This, this is why I believe Satan is the restrainer. Because once he is cast down and the heavens are cleansed once and for all and he loses all access to the heavens and all he can do is concentrate all of his energy, power, and work on the earth, he knows that at that moment he has but a short time. Once the restrainer is removed from the second heavens, Satan's time is short and he's afraid of that because that means to him his final judgment is near. And two, it means the kingdom and power fully come in a last day manifestation. Listen to me in my last slide. The Lord wants to finish this thing and bring us unto fullness and bring the last day end time power while simultaneously casting down the accuser to accelerate the second coming of our Lord. This whole idea that Satan wants to speed things up to get us to Armageddon, I don't believe is true. Because once he is cast down from the second heaven, he knows at that moment his time is short. And that, when he's cast down from heaven, at that moment he will fully possess the Antichrist to trigger the great tribulation. Are you ready for the greatest show on earth? The devil's restraining through accusation. But once the restrainer is taken out of the way and cast out of the second heavens, then the man of sin is revealed. Only he who restrains will restrain until the restrainer is taken out of the way. Then the wicked one will be revealed. I don't know about you, but I want the Lord to finish this thing. And you know, I, I heard that understanding and there's something about it that triggered in me. Because pre-tribulation rapture, they told us that he, the restrainer, was the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit takes us out of here in the rapture, that's what we were told. Then the man of sin can be revealed. I think the devil doesn't want to get to Armageddon. In fact, remember what the demon said through the demoniac? To Jesus, have you come to torment us before our time? The devil wants to restrain this thing and keep an immature, unperfected, spotted bride as long as he can. He wants to restrain the kingdom of God coming in fullness and power. He wants to restrain the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ in his church. He wants to restrain the second coming. Why? Because... When he's cast down, when the restrainer is removed out of the second heavens, he will then fill the Antichrist and trigger the great tribulation. At that point, he knows only 42 months to go, and I'm done. The devil is trying to restrain you and me from coming into maturity and fullness. He's trying to stop us from being brought into the full measure of the stature of Christ and the measure of a perfect man. Because he doesn't want the result of when the restrainer, which is him, is taken out of the way. He wants to restrain you and me long enough. 
until we self-destruct or we destroy our, our own faith or we turn out against one another. In reality, the Lord's going to one day say, <clears throat> that's enough, devil. You fought them, resisted them long enough. Now the restrainer, the one that's holding all of heaven back from the kingdom of God coming in its fullness and power, now the restrainer is going to be restrained. And he's going to be bound and cast in a bottomless pit so that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. You want the kingdom to come fully? Here's what you do. Restore the apostolic and prophetic ministry and bring down the power of the voice of the accuser. God bless you. Thank you for listening.